We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello and welcome to the Sports History Network Showcase, our in-house show featuring SHN podcasters talking sports, talking history, and talking sports history. My name is Oz Davis, host of the Sports History Network's Truly the Goats podcast. Joining us on this episode of the Sports History Network Showcase is Warren Rogan of the Sports Forgotten Heroes podcast. Warren, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Oz. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on, and it's great to be a part of the Sports History Network. I think it's a uh, terrific idea, and it's got to be successful, right? Well, we've got a lot of promise. We've it got sure a lot of promise does. And, and I'm glad that you, you gave one of those greats to us, because I was going to do it if you didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Thanks very much. But let's get right into it. Okay, I'm looking at your bio here on the SportsHistoryNetwork.com website. And uh, your resume stretches back to newspapers. Now, did you, was that always the goal? Did you always want to be a sports writer? Well, I have an incredible passion for sports. And I wanted to get into some area of sports reporting whether it was on air or with a pen. And in fact, when I was in high school, we had a very small, I don't know, a 100-watt radio station. And I used to call the football games. I would give the sports report in the morning, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, we also had a school newspaper, and I wrote a couple of articles for the paper as well. When I went off to college, my goal was to be a on-air sports personality. Sometimes things work out for people, sometimes they don't. Unfortunately for me, it didn't work out that way. However, I was able to get uh, with a newspaper and write sports for the paper. So I was a general sports reporter Grew up in Westchester County, New York, and you know when you're when you're up in that area, there are a lot of sports: college, professional, high school. So I was basically a high school reporter, but periodically I'd be able to go out and fill in for the Jets beat writer or the Giants beat writer or the Mets beat writer. You know, there were a couple times where I was able to go and cover the pro games, sometimes the college games, St. John's basketball, Fordham basketball. And then there were general sports that would happen too. Tennis, I did a lot, wrote a lot about tennis, um, some horse racing. And then we had a monthly golf publication as well, and I was the main writer for the monthly golf publication. So I really enjoyed that. And... Um, but I still wanted to get into television, whether it was behind the camera or in front of the camera. And long before there was ESPN News, there was a thing called Sports News Network. And that was back in 1990. And I left the newspaper to go work for Sports News Network. We only made it about a year. I was there the entire time. 
hard launching a television network and that was not the first that was the first television network I was ever a part of and to launch one and I ended up lo- helping launch a second one too uh we were only on the air for about a year and during that time I started off man this is 1990 and salaries were a lot lower I think I I went to work there man I must have been making about $12,000 a year I started off as an assistant researcher, but by the time I left, I was a producer. And I, again, I got to cover a lot of great things. And, you know, you don't necessarily do the reporting, but I got to do a lot of the interviewing. So, yeah, I covered a lot of NBA, a lot of NHL, and a lot of Major League Baseball where I would be, go to the uh, games, I'd do the interviews, I'd bring it back, and we'd cut it up, and one of the uh, pronouncers would, uh, would do the story. Sports News Network went out of business. I went back to the newspaper, and then along came a new network, and I moved to Florida for the Golf Channel. And that was, uh, that was a pretty good run. I was there for several years, and uh, left there, went to work for the National Hockey League, and came back down to Florida, where I've been since 2004, working uh, for an independent production company, and we produce a lot of commercials, we produce original programming, we produce commercial, uh, uh, corporate videos, so I've, I'm always writing, uh, always producing, sometimes it's a you know, a a golf commercial, some sort of sports commercial. I produce some original programming. And, uh, yeah, that's how I stay involved. I'm glad you touched on your credits at the Golf Channel and for the NHL because those two in and of themselves are quite the range of the sporting world. Let me ask you this. Do you have a favorite? It's such a hard question to answer. Um. I could tell you this, I'm probably in the minority. The NBA is not my favorite sport. I enjoy watching it periodically. The game has changed in so many ways. In fact, I used to work for a weekly newspaper and I would have to go. One of my jobs was to go to each New York Knicks home game and report on the games and write more feature type stories because again we were a weekly newspaper um and at that time i really enjoyed the nba i liked the style of play this is you know when the game was a much more defensive and physical struggle than it is today especially those new york knicks (laughs) yeah i mean i was there when patino was there when Stu jackson was there you know patrick ewan xavier mcdaniel uh, Charles Oakley. I mean, it was a, and you know, they were going up against those Bulls teams and those Pistons teams. And it was, it was a defensive, a much more physical game than it is today. And I actually enjoyed that style much more than what the NBA is today. As far as my true favorite sport, it's a really difficult question to answer. Because if the if the Rangers are playing, I'll tell you hockey's my favorite sport. Okay. If the Giants are playing, I'll tell you the Giants, you know, the that the NFL is my favorite sport. If the Mets are playing, yes, I'm a Mets fan and not a Yankees fan. I it, it is a struggle. But I'll tell you <laughs> ba- at that time, baseball is my favorite sport. So I think the fair the fair answer is I like them all equally. And I do enjoy golf as well. The golf went through such an incredible growth period when Tiger came along. Yes. And I think right now, this year, it's actually, for whatever reason, there's more buzz around golf this year, I think, than there has been in the last couple of years. But even before Tiger, you know, the the growth period of Tiger is just remarkable. And there was a little lull in there. And 
golf needs those big personalities. You know, there's no more, you know, and you need face of the game. Yeah. And I'm hoping that one of these guys now can grab that mantle from tiger and help the game's popularity because it is such a fun game to watch. It, it really is. Especially if you, if you understand the game, if you play the game to see what these guys can do is ridiculous to watch Bryson DeChambeau hit a drive at Bay Hill over the lake and carry the ball over 340 yards is just mind blowing. And if you could get a guy like a DeChambeau, Jordan Spieth is having somewhat of a resurgence. You get guys like that, that have a personality. I think it, really, really can help the game. Didn't mean to go down too much of a wormhole here, but what the hell? (laughs) Let's get into this. Um, How much of it do you think was Tiger, and how much of it was that basically television broadcasts of golf really grew up in the 90s? I mean, you remember how it was in the 70s and 80s. We used to make fun of this stuff, you know, because you'd get the long shot of a guy just kind of, squatting and kind of lining up the putt and then you know standing up maybe and the guys are going oh, that was it. And <laughs> the you remember but now sure. cut here's the shot cut here's the other guy on hole 13 shot you know i mean it yeah. looked like a sport yeah i think the technology has certainly helped the game grow mm-hmm. and tiger coming along at that time when the golf channel was in its infancy mm-hmm. You combine all three things, the leaps and bounds that technology has has made, the popularity at that time, love them or hate them, Tiger Woods, and it was just this magical combination. And the things that he was doing on the golf course, no one had ever done. And... You know, the unfortunate situation that happened in, what was it, 2009. um, You know, he was on his way to becoming the all-time leading winner on tour and the all-time leading major winner on tour. I don't think it's a record that's going to be broken now. And I wonder if he's going to get that one more win to uh, uh, equal Sam Snead. But... He came along at the same time that the Golf Channel came along, and Golf Channel really exploded because of Tiger. We were able to program a 24-hour network, and a lot of that has to do with Tiger, and the, the tour's popularity has to do with Tiger. The money that these guys make, and they'll tell you, the money that these guys make, whether they like Tiger or not, They'll go around and tell you, well, it's because of Tiger that our purses are what they are today. Similar effect to what Tyson did in boxing. Oh, man, boxing. Just ballooned those, just ballooned those purses, at least for a little while. Now it's kind of falling on hard times. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny you say that because I was a big boxing fan. I actually did some reporting on boxing. In fact, I will never forget sitting uh, ringside – for a Golden Gloves event, you know, it, I don't know who the boxers were at this time, but um, I had a shirt and tie on, a white shirt, man, and this guy got punched right square in the nose, and his nose exploded, <laughs> the blood squirted all over my shirt, and I remember leaving the ring that night and taking my shirt off, putting it in the trash, and that was that. Damn. But I, yeah, you know, I used to, I used to report on boxing as well, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was the heyday of boxing. When you think about those guys back then, you know, obviously Ali, Foreman, Frazier, Norton, Shavers, Jimmy Young, and then you move on. You had, the, you know, Spinks and Holmes and the Holyfield, and of course Tyson. The fight game is nothing like that today. You don't have those names. I think Fury is the biggest name today, but I don't think there's a lot of competition out there for him. And it's a shame. 
And the one sport I've just never been able to gravitate to is UFC, you know, MMA. I, I just, I just can't, I don't know. I, it just doesn't appeal to me, but a great boxing match. What a couple weeks ago was the 50th anniversary of Ali Frazier one. I was, I watched all those specials on, on television that's when boxing was the best. I loved it. You're not you're not a millennial. That's why you don't get MMA. <laughs> hey there, this is Warren Rogan, and I want to thank you for listening to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about the podcast. A new podcast will be released every other Tuesday. And on each podcast, we're going to have great guests, authors, writers, athletes, the guys who knew the people we're talking about. And we're covering all sports, not just baseball, football, basketball, hockey, all sports. That includes boxing, tennis, golf, running. And we're going to be covering people who had great careers, a great season, or just one great game. Let me ask you this. How did you get into podcasts? I knew a couple of guys that were doing podcasts, and I really didn't understand what it was. <laughs> and I started getting, you know, they, they, they introduced me to podcasting and I started to listen to different podcasts and I was looking for a new hobby. I had hurt my back. I couldn't play golf as much or as often as I wanted to. So I was looking for a hobby. I was looking to really reconnect with my passion for sports. I've always loved sports history, reading about the old times and guys who were superstars whom we don't know that we don't remember and it's just something that I've always done and when I was talking to these guys about podcasts they were quizzing me well what is it you know you like to do and you know I finally came up with this idea about talking about the old timers whom time has forgotten and they said that's a great topic I said yeah but who else is really interested in that and they said if you are interested in that then there has to be somebody else that's interested in that. You cannot be the only person in the world. So I started doing research and I came up with all these names of guys that I was very familiar with and started looking around about whom I can interview to talk about these guys. Most of whom the superstars that I talk about are stars from yesteryear who have passed away, but every once in a while they're still around. And so I made a couple of phone calls to people that might be willing to be interviewed, and they were all for it. So I said, what the heck, let's give this a go. And that was uh, back around December of 2016, and I started recording shows. The one thing I will tell everybody out there, if you want to do a podcast, do not, I can't say the word, pro pro procrastinate. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's the biggest hang up. They're like, well, what do I do? Just start recording. I don't like my voice. Just start recording. You'll get better and better and better and better and better. So around December of 2016, I bought some equipment. I started doing research, calling people, interviewing people. I always want to be ahead. I, I record my podcast a couple of weeks ahead of time. I always like to have some in the tank. And uh, in April of 2017, I launched my first podcast was about Billy Cannon. And then I did a podcast about Bill Barilko, and he is such a phenomenal story. He was a hockey player for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I contacted a guy up in Toronto who wrote a terrific book about Barilko, short story. Barilko played for five years for the Maple Leafs. In those five years, they won four Stanley Cups. After that fourth cup, he goes on a fishing trip with a dentist friend of his, a guy by the name of Henry Hudson, who's a direct descendant of Henry Hudson, who discovered the Hudson River. <laughs> and um, they never came back. Their plane was lost. And uh, they, Bill Barilko and Henry Hudson disappeared. They were gone forever, or so we thought. 
11 years pass. The Maple Leafs are in the tank. They don't win another cup. They finally do win a cup 11 years later, and the plane wreckage was discovered. Ooh. Pretty cool story. And Barilko and Hudson, their skeletal remains were strapped into the front seats of the plane. The plane crashed, and um, there was searches for years, and they couldn't find it, and somehow somebody stumbled across it up in the deep wilderness up there in uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. After that, I did a story about uh, Ed Delahanty, and it's just continued to go from there. I've had some pretty cool guests on, writers, researchers, some really famous, some not so famous, but they can really spin and tell a story. I've had superstars on. I had Frank Ryan on. He is the last quarterback to lead the Cleveland Browns to an NFL championship. I had Denny McLean on, the last pitcher in Major League Baseball to win 30 games in a season. I had him on to talk about another pitcher, a guy by the name of Dean Chance, who won a Cy Young for the Angels, I think it was in 64. He was a big-time boxing fan, and after his playing days were over, he started the uh, International Boxing Federation. I had uh, Dennis Marook on. He's a hockey player, one of the first guys ever to score 60 goals in a season. I had Red Kelly on, a Hall of Fame defenseman who played for the Red Wings and the Maple Leafs. I had him on. He was getting towards the end, and I had to do some special editing there to help everybody understand what Red was saying. And shortly after I interviewed him, unfortunately, he passed away. I've had Skip Lockwood on, who was a pitcher for the right. Mets. And actually, as we record this today, on March 23rd, my newest episode, episode number 102, was released this morning. And that is with a gentleman by the name of Andre Lacroix. Andre played for the Philadelphia Flyers for three years, was traded to the Chicago Blackhawks. When he was with the Flyers, he was their, he was their top scorer. He led the team in scoring two of the three years he was there. They traded him to the Blackhawks when Bobby Hull was skating for the Blackhawks. And they just didn't mesh right on the ice. So they sat Andre. And a new league was starting, the World Hockey Association. So Andre jumped to the WHA. He played in the WHA for all eight years of its existence. And is the all-time leading scorer in WHA history. And he is... One of four men ever in professional major hockey, that's the WHA and the NHL, to ever get 100 assists in a season. So I had a great conversation with him. I got to get in. I got to get in here because yeah. I'm actually doing something for Truly the Goats, my own podcast on the WHA right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what team or teams did he play for? Very interesting story. So one of the cool things about Andre he played, I think, over the course of his NHL and WHA career, he played for eight or nine teams. Wow. He was only traded once. He left each team as a free agent and negotiated his own contracts, with the exception of his first contract. Because hockey was the first sport to get rid of the reserve clause, right? They got rid of yeah, it before. I think, I think so, goal. but he said you could never do that today. <laughs> so he broke in with the Flyers of the NHL, was traded to the Blackhawks, and then he left the Blackhawks and he went to his first team in the WHA was the Philadelphia Blazers. Okay. Then he left and he went to the New York Golden Blades. Okay. Right. And then from there, he went to the San Diego Mariners. And with San Diego, for a portion of the time he was there, Ray Kroc was the owner of the team. Then he left San Diego and he went to the Houston Arrows, and that's A-E-R-O-S, the Houston Arrows. And that's, I believe, he might have played with uh, Gordy Howe while he was in Houston. And then he left there and he went to the New England Whalers. And that was the last team he played for in the WHA, and that was 79, and the WHA and NHL merged 
Well, the NHL took four teams. They took the Quebec Nordiques, who are now the Colorado Avalanche. They took the Winnipeg Jets, who are now the Arizona Coyotes. Right. The Winnipeg Jets now that exist today are actually a, an expansion team from the NHL called the Atlanta Thrashers. They took the New England Whalers, who the first year that they were in the NHL became the Hartford Whalers, and they're now the Carolina Hurricanes. Right, right. And they also took the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I've been looking at this same stuff lately. Okay, well, gee, you you already answered basically all my questions. I was going to ask you to give us a, <laughs> give us a sneak preview of your next episode, but you did so. Um, you've also uh, kind of sort of answered, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin you to this one. Uh, my other favorite question for generalist sports history fans like yourself. It's so hard. It's such a, it's such a really hard thing. Like I said, it, it's really based on the season. So yeah. my three okay. favorite teams okay. in no particular order right this second are the Giants, the Mets, and the Rangers. Um, I would probably say if the Mets have a really good season this year, I would probably say at th that time the Mets are my favorite team. But as soon as the Giants come back around and start winning games, my gosh, if Danny uh, Dimes can do anything on the field with all these offensive weapons the Giants are getting, I'll be extremely passionate. I, I will say this. I am a huge Mets fan. There is nothing like NHL hockey, especially when you're there in person, in the playoffs, and your team scores a goal, it's crazy. And I will sit in front of the TV by myself, nobody else in the house. Somebody on the Rangers will score a regular season game, and I'll yell, score! The Giants, I think, I probably throw things, curse, yell, and scream more at the television when the Giants are playing, good or bad, than any other team there is. So maybe, but I also think that's because every game in the NFL is is so magnified because there's only 16, well, this coming season, 17 games. Every game is so important. Over the course of a 162-game baseball season, games are important. But, you know, you're going to lose games. Uh, I'll never forget. I, for, I think it was Tommy Lasorda once said. Oh, yeah, I know. You're going to hit me with this one. I love this one. Yeah, go ahead. I think he's the one that said every baseball team is right. going to win 50 games. Right. Every baseball team is going to lose 50 right. games. It's what you do in those other games that that's the difference. Yeah, it's the, six, so, it's the 60 games in the middle. That, that you right. So you're so you know each so when they lose, yeah, you could be upset, but it's not as crucial necessarily as a loss is in the NFL. It's sort of the same with the NHL, but I will say this: the one thing I totally disagree with is when people say a loss in September in baseball is worse than a loss. In April in baseball, a loss is a loss. And if you lose your, uh, uh, if you miss the playoffs by a game, you could point to any single game during the entire season. I think that every loss during the regular season is just as important as any other loss. So, so maybe I took the roundabout way. I don't think it's maybe about which is my favorite favorite team it's the team that might make me the most passionate and irrational person at that particular time and no team does that to me like the giants well yeah i was i was just gonna say i mean as a as a fan your 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 highlight moments of your life must be those super bowl wins against the patriots right well um yes uh I remember all four. I remember all. Yeah, I remember all five games, all five Super Bowls that the Giants have played. They beat the Broncos, they beat the Bills, they lost to the Ravens, and then they beat the Patriots twice. All of those, I think, probably 
the first one over the Broncos might be the greatest because they were such a bad team for so long and they finally climbed the ladder and reached, you know, the mountaintop and won the Super Bowl. Yeah, but everybody beat the Broncos in the Super Bowl in those days. Yeah, yeah. The Bills the Bills Super Bowl was quite spectacular. Oh, that was awesome. That's still my favorite right. game. That's still my favorite. Um the Rangers winning in nineteen ninety four was very special. Very special it was a fifty four year drought. So that was very special to see the Rangers win in ninety four, the guarantee, the Mark Messier guarantee. The Mets win in 86 was absolutely incredible. And they, I couldn't bear to see them lose. So we're at game six (laughs) and they had that incredible comeback. And what I was on another channel was the movie Stripes. And the Mets are down to their last out. And I said, I can't watch this. And I turned the game off and Stripes comes on. I said, I can't do that. And I turned the game back on and the Mets get a hit. I go, all right, at least they go down with the fight. And I put the Stripes back on. I go, no, you got to go back. Turn the game back on, another hit. I go, wait a minute. There's something to this. And stupid superstitions, I kept switching back and forth. I was afraid to stop. <laughs> well, I hope you were near the beginning of Stripes, Pico. All that, <laughs> all that stuff about the RV is not very good. <laughs> all right. Warren Rogan, Sports Forgotten Heroes. Thanks for joining us on the Sports History Network podcast. And wow, keep up the great work. Thanks, Oz. I, I really appreciate it. And like I said, everybody out there, Sports History Network, it's just the beginning. We have more and more great podcast joining and we've joined forces and we hope to bring you even better content as time goes on. This has been Sports History Network Showcase Podcast. We'd like to thank our guest, Warren Rogan, of this Sports Forgotten Heroes podcast, which is available through sportshistorynetwork.com or wherever you get your podcasts. The theme song for the SHN Showcase is Quartz by Ani Tech and is available through a fair use agreement via freemusicarchive.org. SHN Showcase will be back soon with another Sports History Network podcast. Until then, this is Oz Davis saying stay safe and stay historical. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items. Plus, get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.